Good morning, friends. Welcome to the sermon part of this morning's worship service. I hope you enjoyed the videos we sent out and were able to sing along uh, and follow along with the readings. Uh, this morning, we're uh, hoping to improve on this process or <clears throat> you know, fix some of our mistakes. So any feedback you can give us this week will be uh, gratefully received. Um, I want you to know that uh, Matt and Leslie came late Friday night and put up over a hundred pictures of church members on our first three pews, uh, which is just glorious. So now I get to look at your faces uh, and, and none of you in any of these pictures is asleep. Uh, so I'm gonna try to overcome that because I'm used to a few of you nodding off. Uh, I'm even getting to see some choir folks whose faces I don't normally get to see during the sermon. Uh, and, and Tom Hanks is here with us. Uh, I think we have a few other guests here this morning. Uh, the famous Tom Hanks, not Lakeshore Tom Hanks, or Baylor's Tom Hanks. So <clears throat> anyway, I hope as you're uh, logging in and figuring out all the technology as we have been doing this morning, I think it might be wise for us to take just a moment uh, to make the transition from getting here and logging on uh, to being here. So let's spend just a moment uh, in, in contemplative silence with one another, and then I'll begin. I remember the first time I got the disease, like it was yesterday. I was in first grade in Mrs. McCarthy's class, and it was the first week of school. In the classroom, Mrs. McCarthy kept uh, order and arranged us according to our reading levels and our math skills. Um, but on the playground during recess, we were left to our own devices. And we were like wild beasts out there on the playground, like cave women and cavemen, seeing everyone as a rival and wondering how the hierarchy was going to form. Like our ancestors, we thought that a show of strength and agility would give some an edge over others, so the monkey bars were a prime proving ground for us. Anyone who could make it all the way across the monkey bars was sure to be in the upper echelon of playground leadership. I had never made it all the way across the monkey bars before, but that was back when I was a little kindergartner. Now I was an older, stronger, braver first grader, and I was determined to mark my place in our little society. The boys were on one side of the monkey bars, and the girls were on the other. Lines formed on both sides as we eyed our rivals, those of the opposite sex. The first boy and girl <clears throat> who tried to cross the monkey bars failed. I was next on the boys' side. I climbed the ladder and wondered what that terrible feeling in my stomach was, but I decided to press on, and truthfully, at this point, I was more afraid of climbing back down the ladder than I was of even falling off the monkey bars, which were impossibly high up in the air, at least for a first grader's body. I climbed to the top, and I realized, even standing on the top rung of the ladder, I couldn't reach the monkey bars. I was going to have to jump to make it. I thought, better to die a hero on the playground than to climb back down and spend the rest of the year with the booger eaters. That thought drove me to bend my knees and leap for the bar. By some miracle, I caught it and held on for dear life. Then I realized I'd have to let go with one hand to reach out and grab the next bar. And I made it. Now, as my back hand joined my front hand, firmly gripped on the second bar, I saw her flying towards me. She was crossing these monkey bars like, like her feet were on the ground. Every movement of her body was in sync and it was fascinating to watch. I realized quickly that I needed to get out of her way and my thought was I'll just scoot over to one side as far as I can and let her pass me by. I forgot that one cannot hold on to the monkey bars forever and as soon as I tried to grab that big bar on the side, I lost my grip and I went flying toward the ground. Now thankfully our playground had sand in the bottom, so when I hit, it wasn't as devastating as I thought it would be, but it did hurt because I fell right on my bottom. Before I could think about standing up, I see an outstretched hand coming from above to help me. I took it and it was from the little girl who'd just crossed over from the other side. 
She yanked me up like a rag doll and I said, thanks, you're really good at these. She smiled and ran back to the other side to get in line. I did the same, only when I got to the end of the line, the guys who were there moved away from me. I, I followed and they moved again. I followed and this time one of them said loud enough for the whole playground to hear, get away, you've got cooties now and I don't want them. I was shocked. I managed to stammer out, why, why do I have cooties? You touched a girl, you've got cooties. Oh no, he was right. I had touched a girl and now I was infected with the worst kind of disease that could befall a first grader. I had cooties. No one with cooties ever ascended to playground leadership. We all knew that. No one with cooties ever got picked for anything <clears throat> uh, but last for any team. I was doomed. My life as I knew it was over right there in that moment. I stood there paralyzed in this new realization. I backed away a few steps. I only had an older brother in my life at this point, and I had no idea how once a person was infected with cooties, he was ever cured. The girl who helped me up from the ground broke playground protocol and walked over to our side of the monkey bars. She grabbed my arm and called out her actions. Circle, dot, circle, dot. Now you've had a cootie shot. And she punched me in the arm, hard, just to make sure it stuck. I didn't know what to do. As she walked back over to her side of the monkey bar, she looked over her shoulder and said, you don't have cooties anymore. Then she looked at the little boy who had diagnosed my problem and said, and you're stupid. I got back in line and no one moved away from me. It worked. The shot it cured me, I was saved. Our gospel reading this morning begins with a lawyer. He's really more like a professor of the law or a religious scholar rather than a lawyer in our context. Depending on how you read him, he's either trying to trick Jesus or he's trying to prove that he's on the right track and he's doing everything that he can possibly do to prove that he's basically perfect. Either way, he asks two really good questions. The first one is, how do I inherit eternal life? What must I do? Now, typically, when we think of inheriting something, you, you don't have to do anything, right? You just have to be in good graces with someone who has something to give to you when they die. My Mimi, who turns 91 today, and happy birthday, Mimi, used to tease us about getting kicked out of her will. Someone would make a joke or by some small miracle actually beat her at a card game we were all playing, and she would say, well, she's out of the will. But we all knew better. Now, as far as we know, being born into her family and being loved by her was the only thing that got us in the will. And we didn't have anything to do with either one of those things. So it's an interesting question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, nothing. Just be a child of God. The Israelites didn't do anything to be chosen by God. They were chosen, and then they were supposed to do something. They were supposed to love God back and to be a priesthood unto all of the other nations so that everyone might come to know God's love and be included in God's will, or as the religious scholar puts it, inherit eternal life. Jesus, being a great teacher, turns it back to the religious scholar and says, what's written in the law? What do you read there? So the religious scholar rightly quotes the Shema from Deuteronomy, and then he adds the part about loving your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus. And he's right. You cannot love God without loving those who are created in God's image. So he's done a smash-up job in answering this question. But he can't leave it alone. What? What is that about us? Why is it when we, we say something great, we have this undeniable urge to then take it one step further? Hey, you know, those glasses look great on you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, they really take the focus off of your hair. Ooh. 
See, Luke's gospel says that he wants to justify himself. I think that means that he's selective about who he thinks is created in God's image. He has a short list of neighbors, if you will, and they're only the people who are like him. And he wants to justify the, the narrowness of his love and his duty to his neighbors. So he asks, and who is my neighbor? Everyone, you fool. That's what we think is going to be the answer, right? And perhaps if Jesus had been in week two or three of coronavirus quarantine, he might have responded that way. But, but he's out and free and f smelling the fresh air. And in classic Jesus style, he tells a story that has become so familiar to us this day, we just use the shorthand to describe it. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, that would have been a hilarious oxymoron in those days, right? If you just said that phrase, any good and righteous Israelite would have laughed in your face and let you know in uncert no uncertain terms, there's no such thing as a good Samaritan. They might have even said the only good Samaritan is a dead Samaritan. They were so despised and hated racially, spiritually, physically. They were just the worst people Jews could imagine anyone being. And Jesus goes and makes one of them the hero of his story. That is so like Jesus. If you can imagine someone so despised, so disgusting, so repugnant that you would rather die than receive help from them. When you really needed help, as in a life or death matter, that's your Samaritan. They have cooties. There's no shot or punch in the arm that can heal them from this distinction. If that person or that type of person came up to you after a car accident, and they're in a paramedic's uniform, and they're about to start an IV or perhaps dress an active wound, you would tell them, I'm refu refusing your medical assistance and I'll happily take my chances that someone else will come along after you. That's a Samaritan. Unfortunately, we have made Samaritans out of our sisters and brothers in all sorts of ways. We've found ways to make people out to be less than human less than us, just less. And we've done it for all different kinds of reasons. Gender, skin color, past actions, sexual orientation, place of birth, or even recently just being Chinese in ethnicity because we think that happened to be the place where this virus jumped to humans and then spread all over the world. We make Samaritans out of our sisters and brothers, and then use that designation to justify treating them as something other, neglecting them, or even hating them. Jesus makes a Samaritan the hero in his story about how we are to love our neighbors. Jesus makes this despised one the shining example and the fulfillment of the second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. The religious leader can't even bring himself to say the word. Jesus asks at the end of the parable, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the man can only say, the one who showed him mercy. He still can't even say it, it was the Samaritan. He was the one who was a neighbor to the guy that needed help. It's just too much for him. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and love that way. Go and live that way. Go and be that kind of neighbor to everyone you meet. What does love in the time of coronavirus look like? Well, right now it looks like practicing social distancing to protect those among us who are most vulnerable from this disease. I heard a woman interviewed on the radio just yesterday. She was afraid, like we all are, and she was reacting to a big crowd of kids who were out at the beach for spring break. She said, I wonder how this whole thing would be different if it was most devastating to young people instead of old people. 
She said it, it feels like since it only really hurts us old folks that lots of young people don't care. Like we're disposable. You're not. No one is disposable in God's economy and shame on us when we do things that make you feel that way by our selfish actions. Love looks like supporting our medical professionals who are facing impossible scenarios and are now having to deal with limited supplies that are essential for them to do their jobs the way they've been trained. One way we can support them came up just yesterday on Facebook. A doctor from the Medi Family Medical Center here in Waco put up a video about how we can make masks for them from home using readily available supplies. That's a great way to support them. Also, we can let them know specifically that we are keeping them in our prayers and put hands and feet to those prayers by following their advice and their counsel and by helping in the ways that they say will be helpful. Love looks like supporting our civic leaders. Friends, none of these decisions are easy. And we don't have a roadmap for how to navigate these things. We're, we're literally building the plane as we are hurling through the air, and they need our grace. And when this is all over and we're doing the debrief on our actions and our inactions and our language during this crisis, they will need our forgiveness and our praise. Love looks like reaching out to one another in ways that are still available to us. Those who can, shopping for those who cannot. Making calls to our neighbors who are essentially trapped in their care facilities or in their homes. Sending cards or texts or emails to one another just as a reminder to say, we are with you. You are not alone in this <clears throat> unknown chaos. We are with you and we will walk together through this. I can't remember the name of the little girl who saved me on the playground that day. But I remember how it felt to be loved when there was no good reason to do so, based on first grade logic for sure. I remember that she crossed our fabricated barriers twice to be kind to me. And that day, God's light came to me in the form of circle dot, circle dot, and a punch in the arm. God's light will shine through all different kinds of ways. Through groceries left on the front door. Through pumpkin bread left on the porch. Through the big tip that you give the person who got your takeout order ready. Through the kind word to the one who is restocking the shelves at the grocery store. Through a slow conversation with an old friend or with a new one through masks made at home and dropped off at the family health center, or even through a funny meme shared by text, let God's light shine through you to all of your neighbors as we walk through this season of life together. Amen. It is our practice here at 7th and James to pray the Lord's Prayer together during the season of Lent. So let us do that together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you, even in all of this madness, and give you peace. Amen.